you don't get the money if you don't get a yes. Sales is as simple as that. All of that relationship building, the strategy, the thought, the stress, that beautiful slide deck that you put together, all that whining and dining, all of that stuff gets you all the way to the finish line. And then if they don't say yes, you make no money. Womp womp. Sometimes to get the yes, you'll have to overcome some sales objections. Maybe two, maybe three, maybe more. And as you get better at overcoming sales objections, you end up making more money. And we turn up our noses at those high-pressure salespeople and sales managers that grind people to get the yes. you got to close the deal. But they end up having money in their pocket when the client says yes. I think that you probably are a better salesperson than you give yourself credit for. And I think tonight you have a chance to make more money in the next 30 minutes than you can believe possible. But here's the deal. You got to be real. You got to be willing to ask questions that might be a little bit embarrassing. And you got to listen up and learn from our expert presenter this evening. We are talking about overcoming sales objections tonight in the Idea Collective. Welcome to Night School, presented by Bank 59 and Quick Trip. I'm Pat Miller, the Idea Coach and the founder of the Idea Collective. Now, this show brings together our community so we can learn from a subject matter expert and that way we can get better at business. We want to hear your questions, comments, and sarcastic remarks. Really, the chat is part of the fun of being here. So make sure you burn it up while we're all in the room here together, and we'll have an extended period for conversation later on in the show. So start thinking about how you feel about sales objections and how you'd like our expert speaker to help you out. That speaker is the founder of Unstoppable Women in Business, an organization that helps women business owners have sales conversations that win business. She believes that sales conversations should be the most rewarding part of running your business, not something you dread. Welcome from Raleigh, North Carolina, Susan Trumpler. Susan, it's so great to see you. How are you tonight? Hello, everybody. It is an honor to be in here and to see you all and to spend time with you. I love the Idea Collective. I love Pat Miller and I oh. love all you guys. So it's great to be here. We're going to have a good conversation tonight. Yeah, we're going to have a conversation that I imagine comes up pretty often doing what you do, how to overcome sales objections. This is a oh. common conversation for you. Oh, you think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It happens to be at the top of the list of things that we talk about on a regular basis. Now, I brought it up in the opening of the show that some people are just dead set that I'm not a salesperson. But mm. is it a skill? Is it something we can learn to make more money? <laughs> Listen, the book that I wrote behind me, guys, if you're not familiar with me, it's, oh, shit, I'm in sales because no one thinks they're a salesperson. No one wants to be a salesperson, really. Who, who you know, put on their Superman um, underoos when they were a kid and said, I wanna grow up and be a salesperson. No one, right? But if you're not, if you're not at least willing to identify in that way, um, you don't have a business. No sales, no money, no money, no business. So, I am here to eradicate the perspective that they hate sales. It can be fun. It can actually be something you enjoy doing. Definitely. I think the frustration outweighs the fun sometimes. Like we do all the stuff we're supposed to do and they still don't say yes. And that's where the objections come in. It kind of mm -hmm. sucks the fun out of it. So hopefully tonight you'll make it more fun by making us more successful. We will. And let me just put it out there, guys. Frustration is a choice. You, what do you expect everybody to say yes every time? Like a hundred percent, like who, who gets a hundred percent yeses. So just decide that sometimes people are not going to be a good fit or that you're not going to get a yes. And just like say, okay, it's not a problem. Let's move on to the next one and see what we can do. But before you go there, you want to make certain you give it your best effort, that you make really clear um, whether or not it is a yes, a no, or a not now. So that's what we're here to talk about today. When you talk about sales, I've heard you say before, there are three portions of being a good seller, that it's not just natural born talent and skill. What else makes up being a good seller? This is so funny. Um, when I was when I was a youngin, I was a Girl Scout and I was supposed to sell Girl Scout cookies. And I was like, I don't want to do this. So I just ate them myself, which was a problem. <laughs> 
but no, I wasn't born a salesperson. Not many people are right. There's a couple, a couple people, but really in order to, um, to excel at the craft and art of sales, you have to have skills. You do. And they're, they're learnable. Yeah. I can teach you skills. There's processes that if you follow these processes, your chances of um, closing more business go up, right? But to be honest, the number one thing that you have to really pay attention to, to be able to apply the skills and the processes effectively is your mindset. If you walk into any situation and you are thinking, I'm not good enough. This is too expensive. They don't want me. I, I feel sleazy. They're going to think I'm pushy. All of that mind chatter is the thing that no matter how many skills and how many processes you have under your belt, you're still going to struggle until you clean that, clean that up. Yeah. Super common too. And nights mm -hmm. like tonight oh, will give us the confidence maybe. So we don't have that head trash. And I've seen a lot of shows talk about sales, but I've never seen one specifically on overcoming objectives mm -hmm. or objections. So where do you want to start on this conversation? All right. So I want to start by asking folks in the audience, what, when you get an objection, like what is the most common objections that you see when you're asking for the business, you're making an offer, you're saying, Hey, let's become friends. What are you seeing? Pop it in the, um, pop it in the chat. Okay. Laura, tell me specifically the words that come out of people's mouth around price. If price is an objection, guys, what are you hearing from your people? Oh, need to review it with a team. Love that one. We're going to talk about that tonight. Also, J JB, no urgency. Yeah, like that sounds great, but um, maybe next year. Like right now, it's just, you know, not something I can put a focus on. Um, it's out of their budget. Beautiful. Timeline and pricing. So time and money, time and money. I just don't think I can afford that right now. Mm-hmm. You asked about price and Laura's question, and I asked her to unmute so she can give you some color on that. So what about right. price? What is the language around price, Laura? Yeah, I think I'm seeing that in a lot of other people's comments here too, but I just don't think I can afford that right now. Okay. Uh, you know, and not in the budget kind of th that same theory. Perfect. Perfect. That's what I want to, that's what I want to hear. Guys, the words your people use are really critical because, um, you know, one person might say, Ooh, that's expensive compared to other things I've seen right now. That's a whole different money conversation. If it's like, I don't have the money right now. It's not in the budget. Um, that's, that's a different angle of price. So it's kind of interesting because not only do you have time as, and, and it, to be honest, and this will probably come up in our conversations quite a bit tonight. These are all smokescreen guys. These are all smokescreen objections, time, money, and partners. I need to check with my team. I need to check with my husband to make sure he thinks it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Those are smokescreen objections and knowing that and being able to navigate your way around the edges of that so that you can put it out on the table and have a really good conversation about it. That's what we're, <laughs> thanks JB. I've got a million of them. Um, that's what we're here to talk about tonight because overcoming objections, guys, believe me, it's not, it's not a, um, like, I wish I had a magic wand. I could be waving over all of you to sprinkle fairy dust, you know, objection handling fairy dust, but it's it, just like sales. It's an art. So we're going to talk about the art of it today. Let me ask you one more question before we move into our content really quickly. What do you know your percentage, your conversion rate? Okay. What percentage of people say yes to you? And if you think about it, like out of 10 conversations or 10 offers, how many people say yes? Is it one out of 10, five out of 10, eight out of 10? What would your rate be of conversion? Oh boy, I got to put this in the chat so everyone can see what a bad salesperson I am. Oh my gosh. Uh, maybe <laughs> oh, five. come on guys, we're know, friends. Maybe. Yeah, right? Come on, we're let's friends. do it. Five out of 10, 50%. 50% is not a bad rate. 60 to 70% is a very nice rate. As a matter of fact, 
it probably the average for small business owners is somewhere around that it changes, right? Depending on what you're selling, who your ideal client is, but you can increase that. Okay. So think about the effort that you go through to get into a sales conversation with someone. For most of us on the line, nurturing that from being unaware of who you are and what you do down into really helping them understand that they do have a problem. Believe it or not, you guys, here's one of the things, here's something to take a note down on. Okay. I, I don't have the, um, the document to share with you. I'd be happy to put it up in idea collective, but selling, like there's a journey your buyers go through, right? They first, they don't even, they don't really know they have a problem. They, it's kind of like back there, they're uncomfortable, but they can't put their fingers on it. And they need to become aware of, oh, I have a problem that I'm not the only one who has this problem. And there's actually a solution out there for this. Oh, holy sh goodness gracious. <laughs> okay. So if you've got somebody in that, oh, I didn't even know, and you're trying to close them, Mm -mm. there's an alignment mismatch on where they are in their buyer's journey and what you're trying to get them to move to as the next step. You're asking them to make a huge leap. So there is this thing about being in, a, um, in alignment with where your person is in their mind around their journey. So that's just an, an aside. We can talk about that a little bit more, but um, here's why I asked you if you knew your conversion rate, because you do work hard to get people through the buyer's journey down to a level where you can make an offer or you, you have earned the right to be able to ask them to do business with you. And let's say, let's just take Pat for an example. If five out of 10 of those people that you work super hard to get there say no to you, all right, what if you could really handle objections well, have this conversation in a graceful way that you're able to move one of them? just one of them over into the wind column. What would that mean to your business at the end of a quarter, a, a, a year, right? So it's, it's one of these things where I don't believe people say no to you. If they're in a conversation, they have a need and they are interested in enough in what you do that they're willing to have a conversation. So a not now can always move to a yes further down the road. But understanding, here's the key guys, understanding what the true objection is will help you nurture that person to the next level to become a client with you. So it not only will help you get, if you can really get good at the psychology and the art of having good conversations when someone is mm, not quite on board yet, it has so much to do with taking a warm lead that you've already got and eventually moving them across the finish line, whether it be now or down the road, but you got to understand like what's going on there. Why are they not willing to say yes now? Because then you know how to get them to say yes, either now or in the future. Okay. So that makes sense. This is big. This is a really big part of success for your business. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to talk about objections really quick. Unless should I pause here? Does anybody have any questions? Um, anything that I've said that you're like, Oh, <laughs> well, I do want to ask a question. If folks have them, please jump into the chat and we'll include you in the conversation. But you talked about understanding where they are in the buyer's journey and understanding if they're ready to be presented with the offer. It sounds like a lot of the work here is crafting great questions to get through the smoke screen. Is that right? Maybe that should be my next night school class that I teach is how do you really ask amazing questions to get you the information you need to understand where people are in their buyer's journey. Yes, it is. That is huge. And in the objection handling as well. So yes, you're absolutely right. It's a lot about, Hey guys, we go back to that mindset thing. If you are freaked out about having conversations about selling, right. About making an offer and you're, you're tightening up, right. And your your kind of your energy is tense you're not open to sitting back and being contemplative and just be like, hmm, what's going on right now? And having those really open conversations, right? So that's all we're really talking about here is how can you 
um, in, in a situation where it feels a little bit like your worst nightmare, that somebody's going to reject you, which is what everybody's worried about. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy, you know, being found out. Uh, how can you really um, hone in on those skills that you need and be able to have really good conversations that you feel comfortable about asking good questions and moving it forward? So great point. Great point, Pat. And we have a few quick questions in the chat. And you yeah. might be going into this part here in your next portion, but Milena was asking, how do you move them along? How do you earn the opportunity to follow up and continue the conversation? Beautiful. So Milena, if we could just put a pin in that, we're going to, that's how we'll end. Do not let us sign off without answering that question. It's a perfect way to end our session together tonight. And then I'm heading right now to where you can determine if it's smoke screen or a real or a real objection. So let's let's proceed forward. And then Jonathan, you can let me know if you have additional questions regarding that. Yeah, very good. We're heading there. We're heading there. Okay, good questions to ask. All right, guys. So I am going to, uh, you might want to put this in speaker mode or pin me. I don't know, Susie, yeah, if you have. Me. Okay, perfect. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to bring up just a, a just a couple slides. It's, it's honestly, this is going to be way more conversational, but I've got a couple mm, just nuggets that I want to talk through from a, a information standpoint. So guys, whenever someone gives you an objection, right? When they don't say yes, when they give you one of those, oh, I don't know. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's more expensive than I thought or, or such. There's two different kinds of objections that you're going to get. And the first type of an objection is a logical objection. And this is, this is good. They just need more information. They need clarification. And the way that you can recognize a logical is because they ask the question from a, a very, an energy of curiosity an energy of uh, leaning into you going, but wait, I'm, I'm just a little confused. How does this work? How many sessions is it? When do you meet? Uh, what's included in the product they're, they're, you can tell by their face that they really want to understand. They ask it once you're able to satisfy, you know, those little pieces of information that they didn't have and life is good. They usually can move on. Every once in a while you get somebody who needs a couple times for you to roll through <laughs> logistics, but for the most part, they're ready to move on. Now, an emotional objection is completely different. An emotional objection. Ooh, oh, goodness gracious. I just got this new keyboard that's just taking me out of control. Um, give me a second here. I got to get back. There we go. Um, an emotional objection is something that you will answer one time and it'll come up again. And then you answer it again and it comes up again. And you're like, hold on a minute, wait a second, right? So maybe somebody says, hey, it's, um, that's a little bit more than I thought it was gonna be. I'm not sure if I can afford that. And you come back with a logical response. You go, but wait, I have payment plans. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to give it to me all at once. We can break it down. You can pay over months. It's a really, you know, it's not a problem. And they come, you, they're like, okay, all right. And then you're talking, you're talking, you're talking. And then all of a sudden they go, yeah, but this is really more than I thought it was going to be, right? <laughs> so that what you tried to do was to overcome an emotional objection with logic. And that never works. It never works. Emotional objections are the smokescreen responses. Here's, here's a note I want you to take down. Time and money are never a logical objection. They are always an emotional objection. They are rooted in fear and they're rooted in the fact that they're not clear on the value. Because if someone truly understood the value of what they would receive from you, if they took on your solution, if they, they bought your product, then they would be like, uh, this is amazing. When can I start? Where do you want your money deposited? Right. Um, and that's part of your sales conversation to be able to truly 
um, understand how to have a discovery call so that you can understand what is the value of this to that person and how can you communicate that value so that they clearly see that whatever you're selling is well worth it. Whoa, hold on. Emergency break. Sorry, <laughs> you just said something really smart and I got to pull the emergency break. Okay. Because you're an expert, it was incredibly subtle. I'm sorry to break in, but this is really good. No. What is the value to that person? Because yes. when we build our programs and we build our things, we build value, 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 and oh, it's going to be worth so much. But when you sell it to that person, what do they want out of it? What you said there, that really, that really hit me. Yeah. And you know, it kind of goes back to what we talked about the buyer's journey. If people don't even understand what, what it is, what's the problem they have, right? We, we think about it because our marketing friends, and I'm one of them guys, have drilled into you that you got to know the problem you're solving and you got to, you know, tie your solution to the problem. Well, that's all well and good, but that is on when, when you think about marketing, that is on an overarching ideal client avatar. But when you're having a conversation with one person, can you truly be able to have that conversation so that they are, you know, enough about them that you know how to express it so that the value for them is apparent. That's, that's a, that's an art. Yeah. That that's awesome. Yeah. Sorry to pull the emergency break. No, Please proceed. But that was like bombs going off in my head when you said that, I thought that was really, that really is, good. That is good. No worries at all. No worries at all. All right. So, you know, there's two different kinds. It's easy to kind of figure out the logical ones. We're going to hone in on the emotional ones tonight and really talk about like, how do you, how do you help people? overcome. And you just need to, you, you guys, I cannot tell you how many people I've worked with who just keep trying to, especially, I'm sorry, if you, if you identify as a left-brained person, Susie Moon, JB, not sure, but I'm thinking <laughs> if you identify as a left-brained person, you live in facts and process. And of course, what people need to know more of is facts and process. And so you're ready, you're, you're at the ready to give them more of that. And that's not going to do it. It's not going to do it when it comes to emotional objections. I'm sorry. You got to go deep with them. So I want you to look at this picture and I want you to know that your emotional objections happen because you're asking people to change and they cannot see a safe path to getting to the other side of where you want them to go. Okay. So let me be more specific about that. When, let me get my face out of here so you can see this better. Hold on a second. There we go. Bye-bye Susie. Um, okay. So you're having a conversation with someone and the reason they're with you is because their current state, right. Um, is, is problematic. They're not feeling comfortable about something. They're not getting what they want and they want it bad. And over here on the other side of the little creek or crick, depending on what part of the country you're from, um, other side, there's the future state. This is them having solved their problem with your solution. It's a beautiful thing. They get what they want. They're happy they're productive, whatever it is that you solve for them is in their rear view mirror. Beautiful. You've talked about this, but guys, this pathway between the two is pitted with slippery rocks, deep crevices of water that they can fall into and disappear. They don't know how to navigate that path from where they are now to where they want to be. And they not, they're not yet sure that you're the person who can get them across that path. They like what you're saying. They love the picture that you're painting of it. And they're like, ooh, that sounds good. That's the person who says, oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. And you do that. Oh, that would be so good. And what else is included in your program? And you're, you're just like loving on them and you're giving them every bit of your juice that belongs in your side of the house on what you do and how you do it and your expertise, right? It's good. But 
when they go to actually picture themselves moving across the pathway, they're not yet there. They're like, oh shit. I don't know if this doesn't work. What if, what if I can't get here? I don't, what if I can't do it? What if I don't have the time to do it? What if I make this decision and my partner says, I knew you were going to waste more money. I knew it when you bought that program. I told you not to do it, right? There's all this fear inside of their head. And they're like, well, let me think about it just a little bit longer, okay? I'll be back with you. I promise I'll call you next week and let you know, right? Guys, they're stuck in the river of misery. They're stuck in the middle between where they are now and where they can't go, where they, they want to go because they can't see a clear pathway. They don't feel safe yet. Here's the thing. And here's another writer downer. I'm sorry. There's these, these key things that you just have to know about people. We as humans are born to transform. We want to get better. We want to become a different person to, to have more money, to be a higher in our community, to be better at what we're doing, right? We are born to want to change. And yet here's the paradox of it. We are afraid of change. Isn't that crazy? We want to change, but our biggest fear is that we won't be successful. And it comes down to your primitive brain saying it's going to kick you out of the damn community. Like, oh, weak, you are a failure. You're out of the community. Now the tiger is going to eat you and you're dead. Okay. Or as some people, I, some people it's like, and, and you guys will relate to this whenever I'm having, like, whenever I'm having guys, you got to see my face on this, to be honest, whenever I'm feeling insecure about shit in business, I can picture myself living under a bridge with everything I own in a shopping cart. Okay. That's, that's the fear. That's what it is. Anybody ever had that kind of like little bit of a uh, today, yeah. like today, like I had that <laughs> today. today. So yes, like I've had that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. So you are no different than your clients and that's okay. Now that's an important point. Empathy. There's this thing about authority, right? You have to be an expert, an expert in what you do right? You need to be able to share. This is why you're safe because I have done this before. I've gotten these kind of results. Here's some testimonies. Here's some statistics. Here's my, you know, my resume or my CV. Like you need to, to be able to help people understand your, your expertise, but here's the thing. And this is more important than your expertise is your empathy. People need to know that you've been there that you understand them, that you figured it out. Like you have empathy for them. You've walked in their shoes and you've gotten to the other side of this pathway and that you can literally build a bridge for them and you can take them by the hand and you can say, here's the three-step plan. This is how easy it will be. We overwhelm people, guys. We overwhelm people with too much information. And then they freak out because they're like, holy guacamole. That sounds like a lot of work. That sounds really like, ah, I don't know if I can do that. But if you say, no, 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 listen, you're here. You want to go here. And here's three steps to get there. Here's how it's going to work. Boom, boom, boom. And they walk away and they go, I could do that. I can do that. Now, you know, there's about 25 other steps that are buried underneath those three. They do not need to know that. They don't need to know that. Don't burden them with, we think that if we give them more information that they will feel safer. And that's not always the case. You've got to have empathy and expertise and have a three-step plan that says, here's how we're going to do it. First, you're going to do this, then we're going to do this, and then you will see the results in X number of days to that part of it. And then we're going to take the next step, right? So fear of the unknown is the number one reason why you will get any smokescreen objection. 
and smokescreen objections come in the form of, I don't have time, I don't have money, and I need somebody else to um, talk to about this before I say yes. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually take a breath here because I know I've laid a lot of stuff out on y'all. How come it is, um, there is no bridge between a logical answer for an emotional objection, yet it feels so natural to continue to give logical reasoning to mm. emotional objections? Is it something that is in our culture or we were taught when we were younger or something that we've modeling what we've seen other people do? How come it feels like, oh, well, if I just convince you- I More information, I will, right? yeah pushing information two things um first you never really thought about it right so you think about an objection as i'm just they need more information i'm just going to keep giving them more data and they will eventually i will freaking beat them down with data right but we don't know any better but here's the other thing guys even if you know better we call it the f word nobody likes to hear the f word in business and that's feelings Emotional objections are around fear and they're around being willing to face that conversation and say, Hey, hold on a second. So here's what I'm hearing. And here's what I'm thinking and like really get down into the trenches and wallow with them in that emotion uh, to help them move to the other side. And that's where we're heading. We're going to figure out like, how do you have that conversation when you know, um, there's some emotional objection. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So logical objections, easy. You, you know, they're, they're fact-based questions. There's mild confusion. We talked about this already. There's an energy of wanting to understand more. Um, and I went backwards. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. Who, does, is anyone here a jujitsu aficionado or any type of martial arts. Good. Then I can fake it because I'm not either, but I'll tell you what I know about it. <laughs> and this is important. Jiu-jitsu is the art of using an attacker's energy against him rather than directly opposing it. So let me break that down. Who's the attacker here? Um, the client is really the attacker in this situation. You are having a conversation and the client is pushing back against you. They're attacking, uh, <laughs> not giving you what you want. Okay. They're attacking you. Um, and if you use their energy against them, rather than pushing back and opposing it, you will have more success. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, the first step in having it being coming a sales objection jujitsu expert is you shift the energy to neutral. All right, let me show you what I mean by that. I want you all to put your hands up in this left hand right here is you. And the right hand is the person you're having a conversation with. All right. So you're having a nice little conversation talking to each other. And then all of a sudden, the person you're talking to has an objection. Okay, so now they become rigid and firm. And you have a choice. You can push against that objection. So they're pushing at you and you're pushing at them. So you're like, no, but, and they're like, no, 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 blah, 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 blah. yeah, but, 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 okay. So here's what happens. Take both of your hands, press them against each other as hard as you can from, from both sides. Where do you go? Nowhere. No one wins. That's what's happening when you're using, when you have energy that you're coming into a conversation, they push at you, you push at them and no one wins. So if you take the energy and you make it neutral, okay, they're going to push at you. You are not going to push back. What happens? They actually come closer to you. They don't push you over. You're not going to allow them to push you over, but you're going to allow them to come closer to you. You're going to draw them in with a neutral, non, uh, like you're not going to have the energy of, oh, I got to win this. I got to get this. I got to overcome this. I got to, right. You're going to say, really? 
Tell me more about that. And here's where the questions come in. Hey, I really, uh, yeah, like, so what do you think? Okay, that's like the last thing you ask. Blah, 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 blah. A hundred million dollars. So what do you think? And your person goes, holy guacamole, that's a lot more expensive than I thought. Okay. And your initial, your initial reaction is to push back and go, oh, but no, I've got this and I could do that. And the reason, blah, 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 right. That's pushing back. So to neutralize your energy, it's just like being curious. It's like, oh, tell me what you mean compared, compared to what, what was on your mind? What, why do you think it's more than you expected? Right. So you're asking questions to uncover what's on their mind without fear, without worrying. Oh, I might lose this one. I really needed this one to make my months. Oh boy. Like all of that in your mind is bringing energy in that is going to push at them. So you have to drop to neutral, get curious and be like, let's talk about that a little bit more. Tell me, tell me about this. What are you comparing it to? Let's revisit the value that you mentioned earlier. Like it's all about getting really good information during your discovery so that at this point you can say, oh my gosh, you know, you had mentioned that you wanted this and that that was really valuable to you. And so when you compare the investment here to blah, 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 I'm just curious, like, how do you see the correlation between those two? What are your other choices? You know, if you don't do anything, what's going to happen? What's going to happen six months from now? Where will you be? Like, so just like start being really neutral, acknowledge what you're hearing, and then speak from your heart. Like, okay, let's talk about this. I'm really like, I'm okay. You have to be neutral in walking away without a yes. Okay, guys, that's what it comes down to. And being neutral in walking away without a yes does not mean that you don't have a great conversation around it and that you might not be able to move them to a yes. But if you're holding tightly to that, I need this, that energy will push them further away from you rather than closer to you. It's that, that whole energy of being neutral. Does that make sense? It does. It what is again, completely is, not, it's not intuitive in any way. Right? It is not intuitive. Jujitsu is not intuitive. Anyone who, um, anyone who does, oh, anyone who does jujitsu will tell you that that's the first principle they have to learn because instinctively you want to move forward. You want to push harder to get what you want. And yet that doesn't work. It really doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. <laughs> Is there a muscle memory to this when you do this once yes. or twice and you realize, oh, that's how it works? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I hate to say it, but you are actually coaching your client at this part of the sale. And if you are a coach, it comes easier to you mm -hmm. because coaches are just by trade. They're, they're taught how to ask really good questions and how to be neutral, stay out of the pond and, and do it. So it is, it is, this is one of the things, Pat, that includes all three keys to, to success. It's a skill. It's a process that you learn to go through. And then you have to have a clean mind, clean selling mind to do it really well. But let me give you a little bit of a script. And not that I say, you, like, take a screenshot of it, but then use your own words, okay? But I, I just wanted to be able to give you an example of what it could look like in a conversation. So let me get rid of me. Um, all right, so they gave you an objection. You made your offer, they gave you an objection. And how willing would you be to say, hey, you know what? When I hear someone say that they need to talk to their team. They need to talk to their husband. They need to blah, blah, blah. It's too expensive. They don't have time. You know, more often than not, there's something else going on under the covers. And you know how I know that? Because I heard you before and, and I heard how much you wanted and really valued the solution to this problem. And if you really believe that, 
what I was offering you would get you, would 100% be guaranteed to get you that, whatever they desire most, pretty sure you'd find a way to move forward. Like, I'm just saying that this is what I normally see. So in this situation, let's talk a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what's really holding you back. What's under the covers here. And I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to change your mind in any way. I just want to understand what's happening because if you don't move forward, it's fine, but I want this for you. So let's talk about what's going on. Right. So you're putting it, I call it putting the elephant in the room out on the table. And whenever you put the elephant in the room on the table, and you clearly state, listen, I am not trying to change your mind because you're not, you want to understand. And if they change their mind, that's a wonderful thing, but it's not your objective. The objective is to really understand what, where did this go off the rails and how can I help you see this in a way that you can get what you're looking for, whether it's with me or with somebody else. What are you thinking? Feedback to this, let's put it in the chat, bring you on the camera too, if you've got some thoughts on this, because this is really how we're changing the conversation. When we yeah. get that objection and we're being neutral and asking good questions, they're going to tell us what's really on their mind, right? You're setting the stage for them to be safe to tell them, to tell you what's really happening, which will then give you the opportunity to go back and try and close them, right? Absolutely, but here's the thing, there's gonna be one of two things. They are either gonna open up and talk with you more mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, here's, here's the situation, right? Or they're going to hold tight to their story. And if they hold tight to your story, their story, l l let it lie because they don't trust you enough yet. You have, they need more relationship with you before they're going to be able to say yes. So that's when, and here's what I promised we would talk about. That is when Whatever happened in that conversation, whatever you learned in that conversation, please tell me you've got a CRM system where you can keep really good notes about these conversations and you can set a timer or you can set follow-up activities that are targeted. A, I, I know I'm throwing a ton at you guys, I apologize, but it, this is all really important. I have all kinds of email campaigns and automated touch points, and that's all well and good. Once you get to this point, these are personal email follow-ups. You don't put them into a nurturing campaign. Well, you can, like I have my podcast campaign that goes out every week and they'll be in it, right? But I will set a timer for 30 days, for two weeks, whatever is appropriate. And I will have a, and I've said this before, and I believe I might've said it in this, this night school, you have to have a library of value um, assets in essence for the major, the major pillars of your value. And this is part of, and we'll talk about what I mean by that in, in a minute, but there are three buckets usually for each person that your value kind of hones into, and you want to have some assets available so that the one that would work with this, I'm going to send this out to them and say, Hey, I've been thinking about you. And I just wanted to reach out and share this with you. Here's why I thought it was important. You don't send an email. This is the important part. Hey, how are you doing? Given any more thought to joining my program yet? You want to buy? Huh? What do you think? It's been a couple months now. You got more money? <laughs> no. You, all, you have to continue to nurture what you learned about them through your process and keep loving on them. Be like, I want you to know that you can get what you're looking for and that you're safe with me. And anytime you're ready, I'm here for you. Follow-ups are value touches. They're not, I call, other than, otherwise they're an F you. Follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even write. When I go to write follow-up, I'm like, F you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're uh, almost out of time, if you can believe it or not. We've got some chat questions that we want to make sure we get in, but I know you have a little bit more you want to share. So why don't you share that? And then we'll get to our Q&A here. Uh, and then we'll have to dismount for tonight. That was actually it for me. Okay. That is everything I had to really formally share with you. And I'm wide open to any question or anything that I can do to help. Well, and I think all of us would love to sit down and really learn from you. Uh, but 
we uh, have some time for questions, so put them in the chat. We'll bring you on camera, and we can uh, get your questions in. Uh, but we have one from Alex that talked about good questions to unearth their objections. You mm -hmm. kind of walked us through that. Uh, Barbara had a question. Does your book cover the sales process? I'm winging it right now and have no clue what the process should be. So tell us about the book and mm. um, what's in there. Yeah, so the book is really more about mindset. It touches a little bit in the last chapter on process, but I would have to say that um, the best thing that you can, <laughs> thank you, Pat. Right there it is. That's kind of you. Of um, the best thing that you can do from a process standpoint is I have, um, I have workshops all the time on different parts. Like I just had one around the sales conversation choreography. I'll be holding that again, probably in another month or two it was an awesome one for process. So I've got little things that I put out there. So there was one thing that I did want to mention um, that a lot of what I mentioned tonight is part of a bonus module to something that I think is really important. It's called getting TS faster. If you've not done getting TS faster, it's an online it takes about an hour to do self-paced, some worksheets in there. But here's the most important thing. You can't ask good questions if you don't understand the problem or the solution and how they fit together. And so getting to yes faster really helps you clarify in, in the words of your clients, how you can ask questions by using the right messaging and the right way of communicating with them. So I would highly recommend if you were to um, go to gtyfaster.com, it would be https colon backslash flash blah, 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 getting to yesfaster.com. <laughs> or you can just type it in a browser. Sure. Um, that is the best way for you to just get a little deeper into the work that I do around sales process. Alex, I want to bring you on. You asked a question about your big weakness, or one of them at least. I thought it was pretty intriguing. Can you ask Susan about that? Oh, uh, yes, Susan. I think it's more of my state of mind. My mentality is I don't like to feel like I'm chasing potential clients. Like mm -hmm. I tend to be a little bit more reserved. I'll do a couple touches mm -hmm. and not be salesy. I think I'm pretty good at that. Mm -hmm. But then I just let sleeping dogs lie. And then I probably am not good at that last like that last follow-up you know this is so good Alex thank you for bringing this up I was just reading an article online today and I think it was Forbes but I, I can't swear to that there was some research that was done um that it used to be three touches was what it would take it's up to seven touches now before you can even get the attention of people so okay. think about it this way Alex um do you know your open rate on your email and I'm assuming most of this is done via email right email list um oh this is What's just me going that? this is me just going to clients this isn't uh oh. you know so individual outreach yeah this is individual outreach so i'll I'll reach out probably twice not a maybe not a third time gotcha not a problem but here's here's and i would say the same thing i said before if every single time you reach out you are adding value to them you're not asking for something from them without adding value first, then it's not a bother. And I bet you could list about a hundred things you could, you could cultivate. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be your own content. It could be links to articles. It could be industry statistics. It could be something. I'll share it too. I'll share okay. It too. But doesn't no, that, that sounds make great. sense? Right? Yeah. Because I'll, think about you guys think about this. I, I know LinkedIn is a huge, a huge vehicle that's now getting a lot more sales embracing like people are trying to sell through linkedin way more than they used to and yet i still get dms from people where the opening line is my company does this i want this from you and every single time it's delete disconnect but if someone sends me a dm and they go hey i looked at your profile and i thought of you here's an article that I think you would be interested in because of this. Here's a resource that I think you would really appreciate has nothing to do with me, right? Now I'm like, damn, okay. This person is adding value to my life. I will stay connected to him and I will look forward to hearing from him. I can do that. Thanks, Susan. No problem. No and problem. I just have one more question, Pat, if that's okay. Of course. Yeah. 
Susan, will you sign my copy and let me hug you when I see you in November? <laughs> can't wait, Alex. I cannot wait. You guys, last year's Idea Collective Retreat was like the highlight of my year for that very reason. Huggy huggies. <laughs> and bourbon and other fun and things. And bourbon too. Yeah, okay. Course. Bourbon led to hugs. You know, that's kind of how it went. Awesome. All right. Uh, last call for questions before we let Susan go. Anything else that you want to ask or know about? The follow-ups are information opportunities and ways to add value rather than ask about the thing that they didn't buy from you. That's a complete breakthrough and really, really good information. And the other thing I really loved was it's uh, where they are on the decision-making process and the value that they perceive, not the value mm -hmm. that you're trying to create overall. Right. Uh, really great stuff. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. Can I say one more thing? That I, I really feel like this is a really important thing for you to have in the back of your mind as you get on to calls where you're making an offer. People want to buy from you. They are coming on this call. They know the purpose of the call. They want to buy from you. And if you walk into that call or enter into that call, knowing that that is what they want. And all you have to do is, is understand why they want to buy. You're way ahead of the game because how many times have you gotten on a call and you're like, Oh, I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be, I don't want to sound salesy. You won't. If you think about what it is that they want and how can you help serve, how can you serve them? Like, what can you do to serve them and get them what they want? And if it's not a fit, it's not a fit. It's okay. But damn, it's a beautiful match made in heaven when they want something and you provide it and boom, off you go into the sunset with money in the bag. Sorry, that's the, the saleswoman the in me. Bag. <laughs> money in the bag. <laughs> so uh, a great evening tonight, uh, Susan Trumpler. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. If you want to know more about Susan, the Unstoppable Women in Business, if you want to buy her book or come to the retreat, she's doing a double keynote at the retreat uh, going to be doing the Business Made Simple lecture and then the Story Brand Workshop back to back. Mm. So if you like tonight, you're going to love the Idea Collective Retreat because Susan in the flesh for like three hours dropping bombs. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Susan Trumpler, you are the sales goddess. Aww. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, everyone. Mm. I love you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's Cheers. a great event. Night School is really on a roll right now. Roger last month, Susan this month. And uh, if you enjoyed tonight, look forward to our July event as we continue Night School going on to let everybody know about the Idea Collective. I'm Pat Miller, the Idea Coach. Tonight was presented by Bank 59 and Quick Trip. Thank you for being a member of the Idea Collective community. We'll see you next time.